My name is Daniel Courage. So tell me about Greenland, the Dew Lines, and Southeast Asia. How did you get there to begin with? How did I get to Greenland yes. during Vietnam? Yes. I was in college and I was in my fourth year of college and while I was in my fourth year of college in May I got a notice that my draft deferment was cancelled. Not paying attention to the news because I was in college I went to my draft board to ask questions. When I got to my draft board it was full of people all the same questions, college students that didn't know what was going on and while they were all talking, I looked on the little card table that was in this office at the uh, uh, recruit, not recruiters, the uh, draft board, and I noticed my name on a draft notice because I had a low number. I forgot what number it was, but my number was low. So I quietly walked out and walked down the street and walked into an Air Force recruiter and joined the Air Force that day. And so, uh, and then so from there, I didn't finish college, uh, but it didn't matter. I, I needed I needed to go another year anyway because my academic cum was so low, I couldn't graduate anyway. So I went into the service on. June 1st, I think, and I went to basic training, and halfway through basic training, I think it was in July, they announced in the news that they were suspending the lottery system, so my heart kind of sank, thinking, oh no, I joined the service and I didn't have to. And I joined the Air Force because my brother John was in Vietnam for three tours and he was in the Army. And he said, he told me, his only advice to me was don't go into the Army, they're a bunch of animals. So that's why I went to the Air Force. And then I, I, I naively went into the Air Force thinking that I was going to still be an engineer in the Air Force because I had all this training. And so I was t sort of told that you'd take these tests, these are called bypass tests, and that you'd be able to get what you wanted. Not knowing fully what the service was like, that you don't get what you want, they get, you get what they want you to have. So I went through basic training. At the end of basic training, uh, I had a choice, they gave me a choice of three things because I, I scored very high on the test and so the highest score you needed was to be an accountant and the next thing was a uh, a plane loader the person loads planes I forgot what they called it and the third thing was uh, communications and so I put them in that order because I thought, okay, if, it, if that's what you need the highest score for, I guess being an accountant would be okay, although I could, couldn't see myself as an accountant. So I, I came back that I was accepted into communications. So I thought, well, well I'm in the service. And so, and oh, one other thing, uh, before I went into service, when I was in college, I was in a company called Scott's Contractors they were all seminary students, most of them from Canada. And they tried to convince me to go to Canada because that's what a lot of people were doing back then. And they, and they thought I could be a conscientious objector. So I probably spent a, cu a couple days thinking about it and I decided that if my family was threatened I could probably kill somebody so I couldn't be a conscientious objector. And I wasn't going to go to Canada, and I thought it was my duty as an American citizen to go into the service, so I did. But being in the service, I did want to avoid going to Vietnam. Actually, most Air Force people went to Thailand uh, and Cambodia, I think. So, uh, so I was. In so they gave me uh, communications. 
What that involved was being in a communication center, but I had to have a top secret crypto clearance, which evidently is very high up in security. And uh, when I filled out all my forms, I got calls from my the people I put names down for, and they said, like I, one guy way up in Maine, up in the boondocks of Maine, he says, hey, the FBI came around asking all kinds of questions about you. So, so I know they, they investigated me. So I got my clearance, and so they gave us the wish list of where we wanted to go. They called it a wish list, but we all know that that's really not what it was. So I put down, of course, England, Europe, everything is far away from Vietnam. So evidently somebody had a sense of humor and they gave me Greenland. So I ended up going to Greenland. I went to a place called Sonderstrom, which in Danish means Southern Fjord, is right on the Arctic Circle. It turned out to be the major airport of Greenland and it, the, the, the mission was that they supported the uh, dye sites uh, across Greenland and the North Atlantic, and, uh, and Northern Canada. It was also called the Dew Line, which I, I forgot what it stood for, a Defense Early Warning System, I think is what it meant. And so, uh, so our base was, to, was actually a supply depot for these dye sites out on the ice cap. But also, it turns out that the, the place I was stationed, it was, it was considered remote isolated, which meant there was probably only 300 uh, personnel there. There was 600 total, but 300 of them were Danish people. Uh, so it was remote isolated, which meant uh, uh, no women. It was isolated. Matter of fact, uh, there, were, there were actually no roads in Greenland. Actually, the longest road in Greenland was on our base, which went from the base down to the fjord. When the ships came in in the summertime, they resupply us. So, uh, but it also turned out that on this base was uh, ICO, which stands for International Civil Aviation Organization. And that was, their job was to, uh, their job was airlines uh, to, uh, to transfer all flight plans for all airplanes that flew over the North Atlantic, which was every plane that flew to Europe flew over the North Atlantic because that's how they get there the shortest way. So my job ended up being, I was the man from ICO, which meant that I stood in a room of about 20 square, 20 feet by 20 feet, probably 400 square feet. They had about 20 teletype machines. Every teletype machine was tied to a certain airspace area in the United States and in Europe. And so my job was to take flight plans leaving the United States or Europe on, t on teletape, on ticket tape, take it from one machine, go over and feed it into the machine of where the plane was going. So that, that's back then, that's how they had to do it. That's how they transferred the flight patterns, uh, flight patterns of planes flying across the uh, ocean. So I took it from one teletype machine, put it in the correct teletype machine, like leaving New York, uh, Kennedy, and flying to Heathrow, London. And I would have to do that. And so, so all, all airplane traffic came through that room for, for the whole northern part of the world, really. And so, um, and every, every once in a while, a plane was lost. They couldn't find a plane. And so, that, so we had an air and rescue uh, operation and unfortunately, because of my work schedule, I was never able to go on it because you could volunteer to go on these rescue missions to find out where these planes went. A lot of times it was just the information got lost uh, because, you know, that was just teletype machines. So, so I ended up 
also I had to uh, type things on these uh, ticket tapes because sometimes uh, the flight plans would come over the teletype but wouldn't come out the tape wouldn't come out but uh, come out hard copy and I have to retype it to send it on so I, I ended up developing a very um, of course I could already already type pretty pretty fast but I, I ended up, I was able to type probably 140 to 160 words a minute on a teletype machine uh, because that's all I did all day. That's all I did for my eight hour shift. So I was in Greenland. I, I actually liked it there. I was out of, the, out of the 600 total personnel on base, there was only six of us that did not drink. Everybody else was inebriated the whole year tour there. So it was only six of us. We also happened to be the, the sixth uh, in the chapel program, um, which I ended up getting an award for from the Air Force. It's called the, uh, I forgot the name of the, I forgot the name of it. But I, ha I got a special award for being in Greenland and for being in the chapel. Probably because I wasn't drunk. And so, uh, so I was in Greenland uh, up until one day I thought I died. I had this wicked fever and I went to, we, there's no hospital there, there's only a dispensary. I walked into the dispensary the next morning after a horrible, horrendous night where I really thought I had died because of the whatever I had. And it turns out, as soon as they saw me, for some reason, they knew the symptoms. But it's the only recorded case that they know of, of erysipelas in Greenland. The very next day, I was on a plane to uh, Chelsea Naval Hospital in Boston. Because being a remote isolated back during the Vietnam War, if you was in a remote isolated location, when you left, you had the option of choosing where you wanted to go because that was kind of their sympathy for you because you was in a remote isolated. So they asked me where I wanted to go to the United States and since I had a youth group that I helped in Everett, Mass, which is just next door to Chelsea, I chose Chelsea Naval Hospital in Boston. And so that's where they sent me. So uh, they packed me up. I didn't even have a chance to go back to our room. I didn't have anything. That they, they, they loaded me on a plane. Uh, the first thing they had to do was they had to give me penicillin, the kind they give horses, I think. It was, it was so thick that after they inject it into you, they have to physically knead it and break it up underneath your skin. So I, this erysipelas, I didn't know what it was, but when they got to Chelsea Naval Hospital, Every morning I woke up, there was at least four or five doctors standing around the bed looking at this rare case of erysipelas. Turns out it's a viral leukemia. They don't know how I got it. Uh, also, they didn't tell me this at the time, but I could have died. Uh, so I was at Chelsea Naval Hospital. I was there, and it turns out that one of my uh, kids from my youth group had joined one of the services. His, his name was uh, his last name was Rankin, and uh, I, you know, I, I just happened to meet him, and he and he gave me the ins and the outs and told me how I could stay at the Chelsea Naval Hospital the rest of my tour in the service. He had it all figured out because during the Vietnam War, the hospitals were so so crowded. The doctors were so busy that if they didn't see you physically, they didn't know you were there. And so, uh, and it, it, so he devised a way. He, you woke up in the morning. They had roll call. You had to be there every night. But in the morning, uh, you usually had one little job to do, like run the paper from here to there. He would actually hide under his bed after roll call in the morning, and then go around 10 o'clock in the morning, he would just go home, because he lived right 
next door to the hospital. And then he would come back in the evening and have roll call. And as long as a doctor didn't see you to process you out, you could he 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 had planned to stay there. He was a he was a firefighter. And so uh, so what happened was I was there. I thought this is fine with me, you know, because it was nice. Um, because the Air Force was just like a job, it wasn't like the Army. So, but what happened was I, they had received orders from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. I had won this award <laughs> in Greenland and I had to be at this award ceremony for the, uh, the chaplain of the Air Force at Wright-Patterson <laughs> on a certain date. So that, 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 that went up in smoke. And I ended up going to get, you know, get my reward. My uh, I forgot the name of it. And then, um, then while I was there, I got my orders for stateside, and I was assigned to Dias Air Force Base in Abilene, Texas, which was a SAC base at that time. Back then, you had a tactical command and a strategic command, and the strategic command was the kind of the front line bombers and fighters and spy planes and it was uh, you know another uh, very secure I you know I still had to have my top secret crypto clearance and so that's where I ended up which I did not like I liked Greenland better than I liked Abilene Texas because there was no trees it was really nothing there so Greenland was wide open during Vietnam the Soviets could have come in, they could have wiped out the whole North Atlantic communication, they could have taken out the deal line, they could have done serious damage to the United States. Why do you think they didn't? They didn't do it because they didn't know what kind of technology we had. They didn't know how well we could see them. They just didn't know. They didn't know. And it really was a pretty good system. They, they knew when anything was flying up or coming out of Russia. And they knew it. And that's why it was all across northern Canada and Greenland because they could see they could see over the, they could see over they could see northern Russia they could see Russia, and they and they would it would have given us enough time. That's when they had you know the all these strategic bombers constantly flying. They, you know it, there was always a nuclear strategic bomber in the air at that time. Uh, so uh, yeah. So I, and I think the Russians just didn't know. They, they were kind of, in a sense, afraid, not knowing what the Americans knew, you know, and how well, how well we could see them, really. Uh, so, um, and, that, and that's why they were so important to maintain. So, although the ice cap was always 50 degrees below zero. So when I was in Greenland, uh, you could go outside, it would be 50 or 60 degrees out, really nice. You go to the BX, come out of the BX, it could be 50 to 70 below zero. In one hour, in one hour it changed 100 degrees one day. And it's only because the wind would change. If the wind blew off the ice cap, it was always 50 below zero. It just kind of never changed. And then, uh, you know, in the summertime, if the wind blew up, from the from the United States, it could be up to seventy degrees. So so it, it was pretty dangerous. They told us that if we didn't have a buddy and we fell down, that within three and a half minutes we'd be frozen solid. So and they never in the winter time they never shut off any vehicles. So like the the, the MP trucks and stuff, they just constantly ran. They they, ne they never shut them off. Unless they drove them into a garage, so yeah, 